You can be seated this morning. We have some special guests here with us today. We have some missionary guests here with us today, Jeff and Janelle Nelson. And uh, before they come, I wanted to introduce them a little bit. Jeff and Janelle are somewhat new to me uh, as we're new to Alaska and they're missionaries up here. But I got a chance to get acquainted with them just briefly at our network conference a year ago and then have been in communication with them a little bit off and on through the year and bumped into them a couple places up at True North and in Fairbanks and and different times. One of the neat things about being family together is you don't realize all the connections. We just found out this morning that our kids are familiar with their kids and, and you know, the circle goes around. Now, I know they're not new to our church family as well. They have a history with our church family here and they are missionaries that we support on a monthly basis. They are also in their deputation or itineration time during which they also have some additional cash to raise and get the opportunity to come and connect with the church families. And it's really an important part of what you do as a missionary. When our family was traveling, sometimes when we were overseas on the field, some of the strength in what you were doing was knowing that even though you were standing there by yourself that day, you knew you really weren't alone. It would flash through your mind that all the churches that you had been to and visited with, all the people that you had met, all the ones who'd picked up prayer cards and said that they would pray for you. And it was like in that moment, you knew we're not alone. We're not alone in this. We're in this together. And so I'm delighted to have them come and be here with us today and get to share their ministry with you. God is doing some great things through their ministry. I've had the opportunity to hear about a little bit of that firsthand, and they're going to come and share with you. And uh, I want you to meet them today. They'll be out in the foyer as you go out this morning. Make sure you stop by and greet them and talk with them. Take one of these prayer cards. Remember to pray for them. Uh, during our offering today as well, we're going to make sure we have something for them for their, their cash budget today. But as you may feel moved on to give towards that as well, uh, what you give in the offering, you make sure you mark that for missions today or for our missionary guest. If you use our online giving or the kiosk, make sure that goes to special so that we know that th that goes to them as well. And we'll make sure all of that gets to them for the extra budget that they're raising while they're traveling. But I want them to come and share with you. They've got some pictures and slides for you and things to share about what's going on. So Jeff and Janelle, would you come, please? Thank you, Pastor Lance. It's a joy to be back here at Eagle River at Kingsway, and uh, we love getting to know your pastor. It's good to see Pastor Jack and Ann here, too, and God bless you folks. And, and uh, um, we are um, working, and we've been working in Kenya for a number of years, and I want to share just a little bit about Somalis and Simon, Simeon, and Saul. But before we do that, when we first went out, Ruth, you can go to the next slide there. We, uh, our kids were pretty young, and uh, we left Healy, where we had pastored for a number of years in 2001, went to Kenya, and uh, this is how old our kids were then. Go to the next slide. We are now, um, we've been traveling to, um, and we've been in Kenya, living there, and we've been ministering at East Africa School of Theology. This school... Uh, um, God helped it to grow. We were training 129 pastors when we first went there. Uh, by the time I became president, we had 330 students. And eight years later when we left, God had blessed us with 1,764 students to train. And we had the privilege of uh, planting churches, um, going to unreached people groups. And so um, we, we actually planted 22 churches while we were there. And one of the real privileges we had was to go to uh, the Randile people, and we have a magazine at the back, and uh, this tells the story of how we were able to go in and live among the Randile, not live, but uh, take a number of teams and, and be there among them. We saw this unreached people group become a reached group, planted four churches there, saw over 4,700 people come to Christ, and God did a marvelous thing, and so we're so grateful for that. Uh, these are some of the places that we traveled to and, and took our teams and planted churches around Kenya. Go ahead. Our family now has grown, and so uh, this is our new tribe. This is uh, our kids and grandkids, and, and uh, we're so blessed by, uh, by each of them. Josh and Alicia just moved to Palmer here about a month ago, so they're not far, far away. They, they returned to Alaska. The Somali world where we want to go into minister next. Uh, it's a very difficult place. 
Somalis are resistant to the gospel. There have been missionaries working among them for over 100 years, Assembly of God missionaries among them for more than 40 years, but we still don't have our first Somali pastor. We're praying for that. Part of the reason for that is because when Somalis come to Christ, nine out of 10 of them are martyred for their faith. Nine out of 10. It's hard to grow a church when so many of those you lead to Christ are, are taken from this world. But uh, I was praying and wondering how we're going to reach them if, if missionaries have been trying to reach them for 100 years with very little fruit. But then I heard a message on Simon, the fisherman. And, uh, and uh, Jesus said to Simon, put out into the deep and cast your nets for a catch. And you know, Simon had fished all night. He said, we have fished all night and caught nothing. But because you say so, Jesus, we're going to go and fish again. And because of that, there was this tremendous harvest of fish. And I believe that we may have nothing different to give to the Somalis than other missionaries who've been there for 100 years. But because Jesus says go, we're going to go believing that this time, again, we're going to see a harvest. And God is so good to us in that. Also... Um, there was a man named Simeon about three chapters early in Luke. Simeon had believed that God would not allow him to die until he saw the Messiah. And so he prayed for that, and one day Jesus, in, as a little baby with Mary and Joseph, walked in. And he said, Ah, oh, sovereign Lord, now you can allow your servant to die in peace because I've seen your Messiah, Jesus. How did he have that vision? I don't know. But I'm believing, and we're praying, that before we die, we can see 300 Somali pastors and their wives gathered together in one place. I don't know how that's going to happen, but I'm praying that God will allow us to see that with our eyes before we go from this world to the next. And so we have been praying for that. Janelle and I want to go and live among the unreached. We want to see them reached with the gospel and transformed, and so that together we can be around the throne in heaven one day. So we were getting ready. We were itinerating this year to go back in September, but uh, some of you have been praying for Janelle, and in November of this year, she had a stroke, and uh, it was uh, in her brainstem, and, and it was a difficult and terrible thing, um, but she is a walking miracle today. If you see her, Janelle, would you just stand? She, she came into this church, and uh, she is here with us, and, and, and God has done a marvelous thing in her life. But the doctors have said they're not going to release her to go back to Kenya yet. There's still some issues in her brain stem that they're watching, observing, and, and, and maybe give some treatment on. And so for now, uh, we've not been released to go back to Kenya. So for the next year, we're going to be um, kind of on a detour. I, however, don't think we're alone. Saul was wanting to go to the province of Asia, and God stopped him. He wanted to go to Bithynia, and God stopped him. But in the next two and a half or three years... He went and planted five more churches. He raised up ten other workers. And we don't know what God has for us in this year, but we're going to be going to AGTS, and we're going to be working there at uh, the seminary. Go ahead, Ruth. And uh, we know that we're just going to wait until God opens that door. But in the meantime, we want to see what God will do as we help to train and educate missionaries in the master's and doctoral programs of Assembly of God Theological Seminary in Springfield, Missouri. So that's where we'll be the next year. Thank you to this church for your giving, for your prayer, and we continue to partner with you. What we've done in the past has been because of us shaking hands across the ocean and reaching out to the people there. And what we're going to do in the future continues to be your prayers and your giving, and we thank you for your time this morning. God bless you. I don't think we can ever grasp quite enough how much the beauty of what God has done in us is that he's made us family. And we're family together. We have relationship together and we love each other. And it's because of his love for us that we've been made that family. 
And so it is beautiful when we have other parts of the family come to visit. You know, it's Memorial Day weekend. A lot of folks go and visit. We've got folks away visiting. We have folks that come and visit us. And, and even with our, our missionaries to come and visit with us, it's family. It's opportunity to be together again. So please make sure and greet them, spend some time chatting with them today, and uh, get to know them a little better as they're heading out for more ministry. You know, those relationships that we come into, they're, they're very challenging. And in fact, what's challenging most in relationships, I think, is the uncertainty that we have in those that we begin relationships with. Now, if you, if you can't think about the uncertainty in relationships, I want you to go back and think a little bit when you were young, okay? Some of you, we've got to stretch a little bit. We've got to think back there. Okay, when I was young and I fell in love and I started feeling romantic and affectionate towards someone and you, you really kind of nervous and scared to reach out and let them know that, right? Do I let them know? Do I not let them know? Are they going to reject me? Are they going to accept me? I'm just not sure. And there's a little bit of fear and trepidation in that. Some of that's a little healthy because it kind of pushes us to, to do a little bit more and do a little bit better. But over the long term, if we don't begin to feel better in that relationship, if we continue to be afraid in that relationship, it becomes destructive. If there's a continual uncertainty, if there's a continual insecurity in that relationship, that in turn becomes destructive. And so when we love someone, it's very important to be confident in the relationship. Because fear and insecurity are destructive to relationships. They break them apart. They tear them down. They keep us from being really invested in that relationship. But in contrast, our confidence is, is growing then. The way it gets better and it gets stronger is out of increasing the way that we know that one that we love and the love that we have, they have for us. It reassures us, and we, we grow in that. We find in these letters of John that John communicates so much about the love of God, and he's communicating to us that God wants us to have confidence and boldness. He doesn't want us to be arrogant and prideful about it, but he definitely wants us to have a confidence and a boldness and assurance in our relationship relationship with him. And that bleeds over then into our relationships with others as well. And with loving grace, we find that he is the one that provides exactly what we need to walk in that loving relationship with him. We're picking up again where we left off in 1 John. Appreciated Pastor Allen covering for me last week as I uh, sneaked away with my bride for our anniversary celebration, got to visit Homer, a beautiful place. It was awesome to get down there, but thank you for allowing us a little bit of time away. Thanks to Pastor Allen for, for filling in, but we want to pick up uh, where we left off in 1 John chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. He says, Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. And this is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. But every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the Spirit of Antichrist, which you have heard is coming and even now is already in the world. You, dear children, are from God and have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. They are from the world and therefore speak from the viewpoint of the world, and the world listens to them. We are from God, and whoever knows God listens to us, but whoever is not from God does not listen to us. This is how we recognize the spirit of truth and the spirit of falsehood. I want to share with you this morning a little bit about that confidence that we have in Him. We have confidence, first of all, in knowing Him. You know, there are many voices out there today that want to speak into our lives. Have you noticed that? There are lots of voices that want to speak into your life. They all claim to be for our good, and they all have this great information for who we ought to be, what we ought to look like, how we ought to live, what we ought to do, what life is all about. There are no limit to the voices that want to speak into our lives. And they claim to be for our good, and some of them even claim to be from God. But are they? Are they from God? And more importantly, are they, are they for our good? Really? In the things that they speak. Lots of things that want to give us direction. Lots of voices that want us to follow. And John brings that out here. You know, he kind of refers back as we covered in chapter 2 when he talks about the spirit of Antichrist. And he talks, uh, you know, we discussed Antichrist who is spoken of as coming in the end time. But also he says the spirit of Antichrist is present now. That which denies Jesus, that which denies his deity, his godness. You know, in the time period that he wrote, there was a, a, a 
big problem among those who were excited about, oh, we have good news of salvation from God, but we just can't wrap our heads around the idea that God could be a man, you know, and that Jesus could be God. And so he was facing a problem, but he said even more than that, there's that subtle denial that wants to use the human reasoning to redefine God and make him be what we want him to be rather than who he says he is. And so he says, we have to learn to test these things that we hear, these voices that want to come and speak to us, all these voices that want to speak into our life. He says, we've got to learn, first of all, to put it to the test. Now, when someone says to you, I have a word from God for you, I suspect some of you probably have a little bit of hesitation, right? I hope you do. Now, I don't want to ever be, I don't want to be discrediting to the point that I won't ever listen to somebody, but I do want to take it with a grain of salt, as we say. If somebody comes up and says, I've got a word from God for you, I will take that and file it away and hang on to that and wait for God to speak it and confirm it in my own heart, or for God to confirm it through his word, or for God to confirm that again as he speaks. People well-meaning as we are, we all make mistakes, don't we? And sometimes well-meaning in thinking that we do something for God. We may not be where we think we are. And some people just flat out want to manipulate us to what they think is best for us. Paul, even as he went and preached and was planning those churches, as Jeff was talking about, commended the Bereans because as they listened to him preach every day, they didn't just take what Paul said for granted, but they would return to the, the Scriptures and they would comb through it and look through it and see if what he said was really true. We need to learn to test the voices. And we need to learn to test those ideas about how we should live in this relationship with him. Now, in that process, we've got to learn what the test really is. Okay, we're going to test it. We're going to weigh that out. It's more than a grain of salt. How is it that we're going to test it? And John makes it very plain for him. He says, those that acknowledge Jesus, those that acknowledge the teaching of the gospel that we've presented to you, those that acknowledge that he is God's promise, come in the flesh, our redemption, our salvation, it's the gospel, he says, is the test. And the test for us even today and in the situations that we face and the routines that we're in where we have those voices speaking into our life, the test still has to go back to the same. It's to the gospel. You know, my reason and my rationale is not the final authority. I may have that grain of salt to stop and say, wait a minute, I'm going to weigh this out and I don't think that sounds good. Well, it really doesn't matter what I think either. What matters is what the Word of God says. What God has spoken, for His Word is true and unchanging. And so we have to learn to weigh things out in terms of the gospel. We have to learn to apply the questions that point us back to the gospel. Who is God? What has He done? Who am I? How should I then live? Those are the questions that will guide the direction in how I live and how I follow that advice and those voices that speak to me. Remembering in who God is that God is great. He's really in control, so I don't have to try to manipulate things. That God is glorious. He's the one that gets all the praise, so I don't have to try to please people to make them happy. I live for Him and Him alone. Remembering that God is good, so even when it seems like I'm walking through a difficult path, when I'm walking through the valley, I know that His plans for me are good in the end, and I need to be faithful to it. And that God is gracious. He's given His grace to me, and He will see me through. And again, He's the one that I live for. When we remember to put it through that kind of test to say, what then does the Word of God say? Who is God in this situation? What has He done? Who am I in relationship to Him? What then should I do? We need to learn to live by those tests. I think there are those who are a little suspicious when somebody comes up and has a word or even about the voices that are out there. But I'm afraid our default too often is to my rationale and my reason. Well, how does that set with me? How does that set with my past experience? How does that set with what I think? There's a danger in that too. We need to learn what the test is. The test is the measure of the gospel and the truth that God has given. He says, in that, we have a confidence. He says, we have confidence in our knowledge of him, and we don't have to be afraid, one, of deception. He says, you know the truth. You don't have to be afraid of being deceived. As you hold on to the truth, the truth is what keeps you from falling into that kind of bondage. Jesus said, you'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Our freedom from that is in him. We don't have to be afraid of deception or opposition, because there will be those who don't listen, just as he spoke about in this passage. 
As we try to stand for the truth and declare the truth, he says there's some that listen. Those that know God, those that are familiar with the truth, they hear what we say. Those that are wrapped up in the world, they don't listen and they don't hear what we have to say. And so there's friction and there's opposition. And we get frustrated by that. You know, if you want to find out just how frustrating that is, just think about politics today and social values and where things are going. If you want to heat up a room, toss that out in the middle of the conversation and watch them go, you know, because we come from two totally different points of view. And when those two points of view collide, it's not just a matter of a rational explaining of why this is because there's more that goes to the core of who they are than just the rational thinking about the issue. And so he says they don't listen. But there is an answer. And we know the answer for the opposition is not that rational argument, but something else. John continues, he says, dear friends, in verse 7, let us love one another for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God, and whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is made complete in us. See, he's giving us the rest of that puzzle and the rest of the answer. We have a, a confidence also in being like him. We do have an answer for the opposition and for a watching world that's wondering and scratching their head and wondering why we're so strange and these things that we believe and we do. It gives us further confidence at the same time what he's doing in us, our becoming like him. It's being like him in his core characteristic. You know, John makes it so plain. He says, God is love. Last week, we talked about the fact that it's the overarching and the undergirding principle of the kingdom. It's the love of God. You go back to the beginning. You know, we, we know from Revelation that Jesus was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. God knew what he was going to have to do. And that's when it rings so powerfully true in John 3.16. For God so loved the world, he did it anyway. That is the driving, motivating force for those who would respond to his love and his grace and enter into this relationship with him. It was worth it. You're worth it. He looked at you and he said, you're worth it. I love you. And so we find that, that love, God is love. It's his core characteristic. And Jesus said it would be our identifying characteristic as well, right? Right? John 13, 35, he's speaking to his disciples, and he says, by this, all men will know. All men. That's both sides of the argument. That's the ones that hear our voice and the ones that don't hear our voice. Even the ones who don't hear the voice have to acknowledge that, hey, you look like him. When you do the things that he does, you look like him. You are like him. And so that then becomes that confirmation in us as well. Demonstration of the truth, though, is what matters then. You say, well, that sounds kind of like a works-based faith that i got to do, 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 do this stuff. It's not about what we do. It's about what he's done in us. At the same time, you know, it, it's not about doing it because you can't just play pretend and make it work. Okay, we can all kind of play pretend for a while, but you can't fake it forever, for one. It just doesn't work. And trying to love like God loves, you can't fake that. You just can't. You'll get frustrated. You'll get angry. You'll quit. You just can't. On the other side of that, when you really do have that, when God's done something on the inside of you, you can't hide it. You can't be secretive about it. Your faith can't be a private, personal matter. You know, everybody wants to, well, faith, we don't talk about faith because that's just a private, personal matter. Baloney. You can't hide that. It's part of who you are. It shows up in everything that you do. But this is the way it ought to be showing up. He says we ought to love each other. We ought to exude that same kind of love of God. It ought to be demonstrable. It ought to be visible. It ought to be tangible, something they can see. And that becomes the answer to the problem and the question. You know, God didn't bring truth to us confrontationally. 
Now, I'm not saying God can't be a little confrontational. You know, knocking Saul off his horse, that's a little confrontational. But at the same time, God didn't press into us and, and, and those of us sitting in this room confrontationally. What he did was instead he overwhelmed us with his persistent love. Did he not? Did he not pursue and pursue and pursue and pursue and love and love and love and love until we just finally said, I give up. Okay, God, I give up. You win. He said, good. That's where we were trying to get to to start with. I don't know why it took you so long, but there you go. He didn't come to us confrontationally to beat us into the truth. He overwhelmed us with the magnitude of his love until we were just so wrapped up in it, we surrendered. And that becomes the same answer it's the answer, one, that we needed to make the transformation and the change, and it is the very answer that we need to present to others in order for them to get a hold of the same truth. That's what they need to see. They need to recognize a life given. He describes so poignantly the measure of love. He says, this is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and gave himself sacrificially for us. You know, we can think about the stories of the, of the greatest hero we might think about. You know, it's Memorial Day, and we can think about those who laid down their life sacrificially in combat. You know, the one who went back to get the ones that were behind. The one that threw himself in front of fire so that somebody else could escape. The things that happened. We could bring it down to a, a civilian level and think about somebody who would push you out of the way of something that's about to fall. Or somebody that moves you out of the way of the car that's coming, and they give up their life for you. And we think about somebody, and we would feel so eternally indebted to them and, and what they did for us. And here we read that exact kind of story. God took off his godness, put on skin like us, came to earth and suffered and died for us with the full weight of the punishment for sin. God didn't just blink his eye and forgive sin. No, the punishment was carried out in full to the letter. It's just that Jesus took it for me so that he could set me free. That is love, a life given. Greater love has no one than this, than that a man would lay down his life for his friends. And this then becomes the confidence that we have that we really are his because as that love gets into us, it begins the transformation. We start becoming like him. We start understanding what love really is. What love really is. You know, as a pastor I've mentioned before, I had the opportunity to do a lot of counseling and work with a lot of couples. And I've uh, been married for 28 years. There's a lot of wisdom in that, too, uh, growing up. And I think, again, back to when I was younger, you know. When, when I got married, I wasn't real smart about this whole love thing. I can tell you that. I didn't have a lot of wisdom. And I think most of us, when we're young and in love, we don't. We don't get it. We don't get what it really is to love somebody else. We're all excited about how somebody else makes us feel. We're all so excited about what they bring to my life that this is, this is undoubtedly going to add to my happiness, you know. And we're, we're excited about adding to that happiness, you know. They make me so. We don't understand that love is sometimes suffering for somebody else. Love is giving to somebody else. Love is committing ourselves to be there to take care of someone else because we've set our affections on them. And we don't even understand what it's really about. And this is it. God set his affection on us. And he's done it all for us. And then he begins to transform us and we begin to understand what love is. And then we begin to understand how to love someone else. Then we begin to understand what it really is to love our spouse, what it really is to love our children, what it really is to love our neighbors and the people around us the way that God loves them. And so we have a confidence in becoming like him. In fact, John goes on talking about that, picking up in verse 13. He says, we know that we live in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in him and he in God. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in him. In this way, love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment because in this world we are like him. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear 
because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God, yet hates his brother, he is a liar. For anyone who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot love God, whom he has not seen. And he has given us this command, whoever loves God must also love his brother. We have confidence also, and most importantly, from him. From him. What he gives to us. Verse 16 said, we know and we rely on the love God has for us. Depending on the translation you're looking at, it may be slightly different, but it's always the same idea. We've known this, we've experienced it, and we've set our faith in. We put our confidence in. We've pinned our hope to what we have seen and known to be true. God's love for us. It's undeniable. And ultimately, our confidence is in that love that he has for us because his love is real love. It's active love. It does something. We've been talking through this series about, you know, it's nice to hear somebody say, I love you, but you really want to see the evidence of it, right? You want to see the fruit. And God is the ultimate one in demonstrating, not just speaking, but demonstrating the love that he has for us. And it's not just words, and he's given us everything. Greater love is no one than this, and that he would lay down his life for his friends. He gave his life for us. He gave his spirit to us, it says, and he put his life in us. It's amazing. And in that, he has given us all the things that we need for this life and confidence and this relationship with him. And we don't have to be afraid. His love completed in us drives out the fear. I love this passage of Scripture and what it says about fear. You know, fear is that thing that cripples us, that stops us from doing what we want to do, what we think we should do, what we know we should do. It's the fear of how things are going to turn out. It's the fear of how things go. It's the fear of how somebody's going to respond. And yet God's love sweeps in. It's what overcomes the fear because it's what gives us the confidence in who we are in him. I cannot imagine, Jeff, the, the brothers in Somalia, And like you said, trying to build the church there. And you know that 9 out of 10, when they give their heart to Jesus, they're going to be martyred. And yet the fact that 9 out of 10 are being martyred for Jesus is a testimony to this truth. They're not afraid. They're not afraid to die for him because they have the confidence of his love for them and where they are with him and where they will be with him and that all of his promises are are true. It drives the fear away. And so we live. And we have confidence when we are like him, as it says, and we're not afraid when we are in him. And we are able, not because of anything in ourselves, but because he is able. These verses, it says, we love him because he loves us. None of us went looking for God. Oh, I love you, God. Where are you? And finding God that way. God came looking for us. He loved us when we weren't lovable, when it wasn't pretty, when it wasn't nice. In fact, he kept pressing in and pursuing, even though we weren't lovable. And we love him in return because we found out what love really is. And because his love was showered on us. And so we we love him back. But it's the same thing about loving others. You know, John's pressed on that several times now in his letter about loving others. He said, you can't say you love God and not love other people. And he's not setting that up as a do better, try harder. Well, you do this, you got to do this. He's saying, hey, let this love of God get finished in you. God's trying to do something in you as his love sweeps in and transforms and changes. Not only does it awaken you to him, but it gives you the ability to love other people. It gives you the ability to let go of the hurts and the resentments and the mistreatments and the wrongs done and to love someone anyway. And we love others not because we just have such strong willpower to say, I'm going to love you, but because the love of God has so overwhelmed us and God loves them and we see them the same way God saw us and we have compassion and we love them just the same. It brings us back to what we're all about in him, loving God and loving people. Jesus said it's that simple. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. 
not in a legalistic way of, there it is, get your resolve together, go do it, show me you can do it, but saying, let me in, let my love in, let it do its work, let me have my way. As we trust, submit, and obey, then his love transforms us to be able to do it. He's the one that makes it possible. And he makes us confident to do it. Then our relationships become healthy and whole. Our relationship with him is not about being afraid. I hear people talk about sometimes that they grew up in church and they were so afraid all the time. You know, they came into church afraid. And every time there was an altar call, they ran to the altar to get saved because they were just sure God was waiting to destroy them. It's like God loves you. And he understands you and he didn't save you because you were so good and because you earned it and because you merited it. No, he set his affection on you when you didn't deserve it. And he loved you just like that. And he still does. And he's calling you into transformation, not to prove that you can do it. And so we have confidence in that to come to him. Not fear to keep running, but confidence in that relationship to be healthy with him and allow him to change us. And we have confidence in those relationships with others that even when we're mistreated then, even when we're not heard, even when we're not accepted, even when we're not received, we can love them in return and demonstrate for them the answer that they need to hear and trust that God by his spirit will accomplish what only he can do. How do you know if someone really loves you? It's nice to hear it in their words, but you want to see it in their actions. And God has loved us. The demonstration could not be more clear. We don't have to wonder. and We don't have to be afraid. We can have confidence in our relationship with him and our relationships with others. Loving him in return and loving others the way that he has loved us. Would you stand with me this morning? I'm going to pray with you and for you, and we're going to move to our, our response time in the service. We're going to have another song and just allow the Holy Spirit to speak to us. If you're here this morning and you have a need, something you'd like for us to pray with you about, this is the time you can step out and come forward. We'll meet you at either side of the platform. There will be folks who, there who will pray with you, anoint you with oil, and pray, pray with you according to the Word of God. And then we're going to have some announcements and uh, our offering during a final song as well. Again, if, if uh, you want to give specifically to Jeff and Janelle today, just mark that on your offering that it's for the missionary today. We will make sure they get that. And we just want to allow God to speak to us this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this time in your presence and this time in your word. My Father, we pray that you would just continue speaking. Lord, as you have our attention, may you by your Holy Spirit search each one of our hearts. Help us to know where we've allowed fear to rule and reign in our heart instead of your love and your peace. Lord, help us to know where we need to test and check those voices that want to speak into our lives. And make sure that we're not judging them by our own reason, but by the power of your love and the message of the gospel to know how we should live. Lord, let us be touched and changed and transformed and let us be a light in this world. Lord, against the voices that want to deny Christ, may he be undeniable because they see your love in us that is an undeniable testimony of the truth of you and your gospel. 